today is September 12, 2020, and the Tucson Astrologers Guild is proud to present Philip Young, who is a spiritual advisor located in Cary, North Carolina. He's earned his PhD in English from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in 1996 and had a career in academics until 2007 when he retired to become a stay-at-home father. In 2013, he started his business, Black Unicorn Enterprises, LLC. He provides spiritual guidance using different tools, astrology, tarot, oracle cards, numerology, and past life regression using muscle testing. With a home office, Zoom, WeChat, WhatsApp, he works with local clients in person and a distance with clients from around the world. You can read about his practice and contact him through his website, blackunicorn.com. All right, and so let's put our hands together visually and welcome Philip Young. Yay! Thank <laughs> Take you, it away. A wonderful introduction. Well, I'm glad everyone is here uh, and, and participating and doing well. Uh, what I'm going to end up doing is actually using a PowerPoint for the first part of the presentation just to get things up and running. So I'll actually take over and do a screen share and get the PowerPoint set up. And then I'll actually mute my video just as a way to save some bandwidth while I'm talking about what's going on in the PowerPoint. I do tend to be someone who really wants to do interactive discussion. And so at, at any point you have a question, you want to raise your hand, I'll be happy to try to answer it throughout. But once I've gone through the PowerPoint, it'll really be largely a discussion. I hope we get to have about what I'm going to provide with you about Pluto's return in the US chart and a number of other transits that are certainly significant and important right now. So let me get the screen share set up and the PowerPoint up and running and we will get underway. If everybody can stop their video, that would be nice uh, so that we just see your names. All right, so Pluto's return and it will return to its original degree approximately every 247 years. So on February 19th, 2020 at 1022 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Pluto will return to 27 degrees and 32 minutes in Capricorn, the position it was in on the birth of the United States on July 4th, 1776. Now, Gail had a nice introduction. I'm going to give you a little bit more information about me. I am a tropical Western astrologer, and I use the whole sign system when I cast my charts. Uh, depending on your level of knowledge about astrology, there are multiple house systems that a certain person can select to do their uh, work as an astrologer. Placidus is the most common. It's sort of the default. If you went to, say, an astro.com or you picked up a beginning astrology book, most of those astrologers and most of those websites are going to be using Placidus for its system of houses. I mention this because it can make the houses and the appearance of the chart very different if you're familiar with Placidus. Um, I actually started out on that myself, but I eventually switched over to the whole sign and that's what I use in my practice. As Gail said, I hung out my shingle, shingle in 2013, starting a professional practice under the name Black Unicorn Enterprises. Um, in my personal profile, I am an Aries sun with a Libra moon and it's opposing within less than two degrees of an approaching orb. And then I have Scorpio as my ascendant with Neptune rising just over my ascendant, also approaching but retrograde. It's actually less than three degrees and moving back towards my ascendant on the day of my birth. Before I became a full-time spiritual advisor, I did earn a doctorate in English in 1996 and taught at University English classes at the University of North Carolina for about 15 years from 1992 to 2007. And I do write extensively for askastrology.com. So if you were ever interested in seeing some of my articles that range on the topics that Gail mentioned, uh, you can certainly go to this website and this is my author page and start there uh, and find the different articles that I'm writing. Um, I do write a number of normal, of regular articles each month. Uh, one of them is a cosmic weather type of article. I do a tarot horoscope that comes out at the beginning of each month. I do a, an article on the new moon and the full moon each month. So they have me doing quite a bit of writing for them and I really enjoy it. I also wrote a beginner book. I did it through Balboa Press. So it's a sort of a hybrid of self-publication, but they are a subsidiary of Hay House. So they also provided some editorial work 
I'm very happy with what the book turned out to be. This is actually the title of it, Astrology Unlocked. And it is um, a book that tried to answer for me one of the problems I faced when I was trying to learn astrology. And that is most beginner books will talk to you about a sun sign in a particular, a sun in a particular sign, uh, sun in a particular house, Mercury in a particular sign, Mercury in a particular house. And what they didn't do in those books is they didn't combine those two to give you a complete sort of basic level interpretation, which is what does it mean for your son to be in X sign and Y house? That, that combination is really, in, in many ways, the, the starting point. So I uh, created a set of tables that take into account all of the combinations for um, each of the points and covers it through all 12 signs. So uh, the book is really trying to address that first level of interpretation and um, I got this published back in 2013, and it can be purchased on Amazon. Um, I also created a tarot deck um, with photographer Sasha Campbell. Uh, we use black and white photography. The title of the deck is The Tarot of the Human Experience. Um, this one I actually paid for and created myself. Unfortunately, I was unable to get either uh, U.S. Game Systems or Llewellyn or anyone to pick it up, mainly because, and, and I wasn't surprised by that, because it is a photographic deck, and, and they don't do particularly well in the open market. But this was a labor of love and, and I've been very happy with what was produced and, and Sasha shot some amazing photographs. So these are just some of the things that are reflective of my professional credentials and the work that I've done in, in each of these fields. Now, what I want to discuss today is the Pluto return in relation to the US chart. So Pluto is currently transiting through Capricorn and the return is in 2020. There'll be three passes starting on February 19th and ending on December the 28th. I'll also talk a little bit today about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius, which will occur on December 21st of this year. And then I want to talk about Chiron being in Aries, which it went in in 2019 and will exit in 2026. Uranus is in Taurus currently right now. And then Neptune has been in Pisces since 2010. And each of these transits are significant to a lot of things that we're dealing with in our current age. There's a just a combination of quite powerful influences that are in histor and historically, they were on their own, very significant for this country, but they are all merging together at this particular time. So we are really getting what I would call unprecedented times. Um, it is not hyperbole to say that the times that we're living in are truly unprecedented. I will be using the Ebenezer Sibley or Sibley US chart um, that is set for July 4th, 1776 at 5, 10 p.m. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this is what the chart looks like. And again, whenever doing a presentation, it's hard to know each person's level of experience. And I, I, I will try my best to acknowledge there may be some uh, novices or people that are not as familiar with the astrological symbology or the astrological language. But also, I know we've got some probably fellow professionals that are participating as well. So with the, uh, the Sibley chart, I'm going to do a little bit of drawing here, which is one of the things that's just absolutely wonderful about Zoom can't say enough about this particular platform. I've been using it for quite some time and really do enjoy it. So the ascendant or the rising sign for the US chart is Sagittarius. And the sun sign happens to be in Cancer. And with this particular time being utilized, then the sun ends up in the eighth house. And the moon for the United States is Aquarius. It's down here in the third house. Um, I'm not really going to do a lot of discussion about trying to interpret the US chart. I'm gonna really set it against the backdrop of the, uh, the transit that's going on. But I do think this is a good chart in terms of thinking about the United States, first of all, as in some ways, I guess viewed um, sort of the caretaker of the world, taking on that role of uh, looking after the world, being the, the superpower uh, that it's been for quite some time. I do think that the Aquarian moon shows the very unusual nature, um, the actual sort of thinking process of being innovative, uh, a land of innovation, a place where people can come in and they can sort of make their mark, uh, be different as it turns out uh, and, and succeed. And then the Sagittarian ascendant of going out into the world proselytizing. I always think of the Sagittarius ascendant as the missionary uh, spreading the word. And so there's a lot to this chart that makes sense in terms of the United States personality and identity. And we'll talk more about that as we look at the actual transit of Pluto and the transiting points at the time that Pluto is reaching its return. So I'm gonna clear this out. 
Now this chart we're looking at is um, the chart and I've actually added some additional points to it. Uh, when I do my practice, I use a number of asteroids actually in my chart. So what you'll see here are some points that popped up that were not in the previous chart. These would include this point here, Hygieia, which is a health point or health energy. This symbol here next to the symbol for Neptune is Lilith, which is uh, the dark moon Lilith. It's what we're unyielding about in terms of our energy field. Next to Saturn is Juno, which is a duty and commitment energy. Um, over here, we have Vesta, which actually is going to be quite interesting because as you can see that it's in Taurus. Um, if you do know a little bit about astrology, what's going on right now is that uh, Taurus has Uranus moving through it. So there's quite a bit of disruption going on in our daily lives. And around the time of the Pluto return, Uranus will be right on top of the, the natal Vesta for the United States. Chiron has become a more permanent player. It was in the previous chart. It's our wound that we have to heal in this lifetime. Down here at the bottom, this point is Ceres. This is uh, nourishment. It's how we're nourished uh, in, in terms of that energy point and play in the chart. And then very close to the moon here in the US chart, this is Pallas Athena, which I interpret as strategic thinking. So one of the things, of course, that has continued to grow in astrology is the addition of points that are related to the asteroid field, a lot of different ways to look at charts. These are some points that I, that I did add that I find nuance and add value in interpreting charts, whether it's charts for individuals or charts for the United States. So one of the things that um, this really presentation is trying to address, and, and hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions, is the larger, larger cycles in astrology. And if you haven't read Richard Tarnas's book, Cosmos and Psyche, I do highly recommend it. Um, he also wrote uh, The History of the Western World. And it's a look at these large cycles that we're going to be talking about today. And it's uh, an excellent book. It's, it's a very interesting way to see astrology on scale and what it suggests as uh, the planets and individual nations are moving through astrological cycles. So Pluto entered Capricorn on January 25th, 2008. And most of us will remember 2008 in the United States and probably around the world as the year of the financial crisis with the bubble in the housing market. And the, well, then at that time was considered the great recession began after uh, this housing bubble broke. Pluto's psychological process um, is to penetrate, integrate, transform, heal, regenerate, purify, cleanse, eliminate, distrust, control, coerce, dominate, scheme, sabotage, and destroy. I would say we probably had a little bit of every one of those definitions going on in the world currently right now. And then Capricorn's psychological need is perfection, success, structure, order, and control. And these words um, and this information comes from Glenn Perry's book, Astro Psychology, also an excellent book that I would recommend. Um, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated beginner book, but he is a wonderful writer and conveys the concepts well. He's also a practicing and professional psychotherapist. So it's an interesting read and, and I do recommend checking that book out as one to put in your library. Now Pluto is in the second house of the US chart at this time and was at, at the time of its birth. And the concerns for the second house are approach to money, physical resources and possessions, that's which gives pleasure, comfort, and security, one's attitude toward the physical body and bodily needs, sensual gratification, and a focus on attachment and ownership and issues around safety and stability. Um, there's definitely these issues around safety, safety and stability that we are uh, feeling a lot of disruption that is not only due to Pluto, but also due to the other points that are currently transiting right now. But without a doubt, the I would say the greatest impact is at a very personal level of our, our personal finances and how we uh, take care of ourselves and we manage our resources. Now, looking at the converging larger cycles in astrology, some of the key aspects preceding Pluto's return in 2020 include um, Uranus and Aries squaring Pluto and Capricorn, which took place during 2012 to 2015. The last time uh, Uranus and Pluto interacted was in 1964 to 1966 when they were conjunct in Virgo. And then the previous one of the squares before that was Uranus and Aries square in Pluto and Cancer in 1932 to 1934. So it's easy to see why this particular time period is 
fairly turbulent because the previous times these energies were interacting were turbulent in their own ways. Also, there are some key aspects preceding Pluto's return in 2020. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto were all conjuncting Capricorn in January of this year. And I was asked many times um, about that particular merging starting as far back as 2015. Now, there may have been an astrologer out there or maybe other astrologers that were able to identify the virus. I was not one of them. But what I could absolutely say with confidence is that 2020 was going to be an, an, a very dynamic and uh, important year and was going to probably have a profound effect globally. Uh, the virus happened to be the, the way it did occur, but anyone that was looking at this combination was going to know that 2020 was going to be a standout year. Um, Jupiter and Saturn will actually conjunct in Aquarius uh, at the end of the year, December 21st, 2020. Now that conjunction takes place every 20 years. It doesn't occur in the same sign and it doesn't occur in any sequence. Um, interestingly enough, I decided to start working my way back to find out when the last time Jupiter and Saturn did happen to be conjunct in Aquarius. And I'll be honest, I stopped after 700 years because it wasn't conjunct in Aquarius up until that point. So this a combination of Jupiter and Saturn being conjunct in Aquarius is, is going to be new and it's going to have a certain type of, uh, of interpretation, which I will also hopefully get to discuss with you during the presentation and, and question and answer. Um, Neptune opposes the U.S. natal Neptune, and it will be doing that from 2021 to 2022. So not only will we be getting the Pluto return, Neptune will be opposing itself at the same time. Now, once again, I don't know how what everybody's astrological knowledge is, but hopefully you can hear from my voice that what I'm trying to sort of convey is that this is a big deal. Um, the, the return of Pluto in and of itself is huge drop on top of that Neptune opposing itself. Anytime the, a point is doing something in an aspect in relation to itself, it's going to have a significant impact. Coinciding with Pluto's return in 2020 are a number of different in interesting points, and I've identified the times they were most recently in these particular signs. So Saturn will be in Aquarius. Um, the last time it was there was 1991 to 1994. Chiron is currently in Aries and will be in Aries during the return. And the last time was 1969 to 1977. Uranus was in Taurus from 1935 to 1943. Neptune was in Pisces to, from 1848 to 1961. And Pluto was in Capricorn from 1762 to 1777. So if you have a bit of knowledge about U.S. history, you will know that each of these has some significant impacts that are going to have played into where we currently are in the development of the United States and, and its sort of concerns and struggles. So the aspects and sign sharing with the points in the U.S., um, Saturn and Aquarius is in the same sign as the U.S. moon. Chiron is actually making a return. It'll be make its fifth return along with the same time that you've got the Pluto return going on. Um, Uranus and Taurus will be merging with the U.S. Vesta, which I mentioned earlier, and Neptune and Pisces will be opposing itself. Looking at the um, key events in U.S. history, uh, and again, I just pulled out ones that, that stood out that are probably also showing up in the dialogue right now. The last time Saturn was in, in Aquarius in the United States, the 1994 crime bill was passed, and that is certainly something that is part of the dialogue right now politically. In 1971, while Chiron was in Aries, the U.S. went off the gold standard. We went to what's called a fiat currency, um, up until 1971, if you had a dollar bill in your pocket, you could actually go to uh, the government and get a certain amount of gold to replace that dollar bill you were carrying around. Um, now it's all uh, assigned to how we feel about money rather than being attached to an actual object like gold. Um, the last time that Uranus was in Taurus, we have, of course, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which changed daily life. Um, it changed our sense of security in the United States, if we think of Taurus also as the ruler of the second house. And then when Neptune was in Pisces, it ended in 1861, its journey, and that was the start of the Civil War. And then, of course, Pluto in Capricorn is the American Revolution. So if you think about it, um, in terms of what's going on right now, you have energy that was parallel to a period of time when you have the Great Depression and World War II with Uranus. You have the start of the Civil War. You have a shift in the economic structure of the United States. Um, and you also have issues around um, Crime, the crime bill that's associated with, of course, um, racial issues. Now, 
the key charts to consider before the return, these are some that I've, I've looked at and will show you these charts. And then once again, um, I'm really hitting you with a lot of information, but this is going to revert over to a discussion. And to me, that's the best way to try to learn and answer questions and, and get some feedback from people as well as give information. But of course, November 3rd is going to be the date of the election. And I've cast a chart for November 3rd, um, 1201 AM that we'll take a look at. December 21st, that will be that um, combination of uh, Jupiter and Saturn merging together. And what I'm saying about that is I know that it's probably going to be a question on people's mind of, you know, how's the election going to turn out? Where are we going to be going with regard to the status of the world? Um, what I can tell you is, is that we are enduring a tremendous amount of chaos and that Jupiter and Saturn going into Aquarius and Aquarius being a fixed sign and then merging together will bring some form of stability. But what I will not say or, or go on record as saying whether I think that stability is going to be some sort of um, emergent new socialism or whether that stability could be fascism because Aquarius has both a positive representation and a shadow representation. The idea is that, that somewhere along the lines with those two energies merging, that the, the instability will coalesce in some way, shape, or form. Then January 20th, 2021 is the presidential inauguration. And what I did was I'm actually casting a chart for a very specific time, 12, 19 and 15 seconds PM is the exact time in Washington when the sun in the mid heaven, the sun will be at its highest point at that particular moment. I wanted to see what that chart revealed. And then May 1st on 2021 um, at 814 is when there will be an exact opposition of Neptune to itself. So this first chart is the presidential election and we'll be able to go back and look at these charts once we get into the discussion phase of the presentation. I just wanna give you a, an opportunity to see that this is the chart that's been cast for that particular date. And then I also cast a chart with the US chart on the inside and the uh, presidential election chart on the outside. Again, something that when people ask questions, I may go here and reference this chart to try to answer those questions. To me, that's really the, the power of the astrology is you have a question and I would like to, as an astrologer, try to answer your question with what I can see from the interaction of the natal chart of the US and whatever the event might be at that particular time that's going to be significant. Also, here is the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction, and that is going to occur at zero degrees in 28 minutes. I'll do a little quick uh, drawing here to show you where I'm talking about. So right here, these two points are going to be merged just inside of Aquarius, and that will be on December the 21st. And again, I've also created a chart that shows this particular date in relation to the US chart. So here is the US chart and this is the uh, Jupiter Saturn conjunction. Then the presidential inauguration, this is what the chart of the inauguration is going to look like. Um, it will also occur with the sun at zero degrees of Aquarius on January the 20th. And again, it's matched up with the midheaven, this MC at the very top at zero degrees and 52 minutes. So in both ways, the conjunction for Jupiter and Saturn and the, the day of the inauguration is going to be right at the very beginning of Aquarius, a new age of some sort or another. And then this is the opposition day. Um, um, uh, this is the presidential inauguration in relation to the natal US chart. And then this will be the day when Neptune will actually oppose the natal chart. So I wanted to look at that separately and see what's going on. And there are definitely a number of interesting factors that will be discussed when we get to looking at this chart. And then here is the natal chart with the Neptune opposition that occurs on May 1st, 2021. So there's a lot going on and it's a lot of information, which is why I'm always glad things are being recorded and you'll have time to go back and review this uh, and, and, and digest it and think about it. Now, there will be three exact conjunct transits of Pluto in the U.S. natal chart. The first one will be February 19, 2022 at 10.22 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The second, which is the retrograde, will be on July the 11th, 2022 at 6.06 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then the final one will be December 27, 2022 at 7.20 p.m. And because of Pluto's slow movement, 
it will actually be at the exact degree several hours. So um, it will it will be past its exact connection for the final time on actually December the 28th. So here is the first natal return. So this is the chart of the United States. And what I did in this case is I limited it to just the outer points. So Pluto's at the bottom. Um, and actually, for people who might not know the symbols, I'm going to just mention each one and circle each one. So here is Pluto, and it is aligned with the natal Pluto of the US. And this will be on February 19th. The next symbol running across the bottom, this will be Saturn's position. And then you have Jupiter at this position here on that date. And then Neptune and Chiron, which is working its way towards its return with Chiron here. And as you can see, Neptune at 22 degrees will also be opposing the natal Neptune. And then you have Uranus here and Taurus, and it is advancing on the US Vesta at this particular point. And Saturn is advancing on the US moon. So all of this is going to be very important information to talk about or try to answer what's going to be going on. Now the retrograde Pluto return, um, sorry, this is, I'm sorry, this is actually the chart with the, all of the points. So this would be the day in which I brought in the faster moving points along with the slower moving points. So um, if we, and uh, let's see if I can actually go backwards. So the previous chart is just the outer points and then the next chart is the full day, including where the moon will be at that time, where the sun will be, et cetera. Now this is the retrograde chart. So Pluto is in its position here in alignment with natal Pluto, but they are both retrograde. It was retrograde at the time the US chart came into a, uh, the birth chart for the US chart. Saturn will also happen to be retrograde at that time, as well as, as Neptune. So once again, a lot of significant factors in play at these at, over the duration of this transit. And then here is the full day along with the natal chart. And then this is the last transit, the final transit before it releases, and then the full day. So escape out of here and get back to where I can see the, hopefully see, stop the share. All right, so at this point, I've covered every bit of information that I wanted to cover. And I would like to really open it up for questions and, um, and what people would like to know in terms of what this information could mean for the, the United States, because the United States is definitely going through upheaval. Um, the fact of the matter is, is the primary upheaval point of time has not arrived yet. That's still a couple of years out. So Gail, if you'd like to come in and sort of, or Tom come back on and, and sort of control the discussion, um, let me know how I can answer people's questions. I was noticing in that uh, the the Pluto return by retrograde that it was right after the the, uh, the solar return of that year, and so I think that would be particularly um, interesting uh, to think about the the Pluto return in conjunction with a solar return. Um, we place particular emphasis on that even in, the, but that that period of time uh, should be really interesting. I would agree. And, and okay, so, so, okay, so, so, do you see the do you see the questions? Here's one from Debbie. Uh, she's um, and just asked uh, a question. If you'll read me the question, Gail, that way I can keep my screen sure. share in place, and then I can go to the sure. chart. So if you can, if you can read, the I would love to do that. That would be fantastic. I would do that happily. Okay, so from Debbie, do you see us going into another civil war peaking in? Well, I think what we're already seeing is the, the nature of that energy in play. Um, and so to me, one of the things that I would say is, is important from any sort of spiritual process is that we have a chance to reconnect with something that may not have been resolved fully, and we're going to have a chance to face that energy once again. And the thing that's very difficult about this time period, and, and I, it, it's, it's challenging for me as well, being someone who's really trying to look at the information, is that, that we're not supposed to know until we're sort of in the middle of it. And um, so we do definitely have the components to have a civil war type of energy that's already showing up in 
the increasing violence between protesters and militia. So that energy is already out there as to how broadly it spreads or how significantly it shows up, that will be something that we have to just pay attention to. But the main thing of the astrology is letting us know that it's absolutely in play. Hey, I have a, a question from Elizabeth Schur. Um, November 13, 2020 is the Mars stationary direct with a similar configuration of Pearl Harbor and anti, anti, anti I don't know what the, how to say that word, A-N-T-I-E-T-A-M. Could this begin that war? Well, again, you know, Mars being in Aries and also squaring with all of the points that are in Capricorn, that would be Jupiter, Saturn, and, um, and Pluto. Uh, there's definitely, the grounds are here. That, that's really part of the energy is that we are supposed to be on the precipice and we will have to make decisions individually and we will have to watch what decisions are gonna be made at a global level. The, the thing that holds us at, a, at an advantage, even though they are to some extent there's a tremendous amount of backlash against globalization. The global interconnectedness does give us some cushioning, I think, against the idea of going into a, a warlike situation as an attempt to somehow get out of whatever the economic struggles or even the social struggles would be. But once again, observing that is, again, part and parcel of why this time is so dramatic and so significant is that these pieces, as you can point out, are reflective of very difficult and violent times in US history. And we are, are sort of challenged by those currently. And the question is going to be, how far have we gotten along in terms of our society and a question of disruption? How, how, how much are we willing to do that? But the possibility of these things being present cannot be downplayed. I, I, I mean, I would love to be able to talk about rainbows and kittens, but most of the clients that I work with individually, they ask me what the sort of mood of astrology is or, or how to, to think about this time, I will tell people very honestly that you want to be, uh, it's like driving defensively if you're out on the road, you want to hunker down, you want to be frugal, you want to do the protective things because the volatility level is extremely high. And of course, it's not going to be helped by the fact that, you know, Mars has just gone retrograde and is now going to go back and square these points in Capricorn, which is going to just begin increase the level of volatility. And so um, these are, these are really, times in which you need to be very thoughtful about where you are and how people are behaving around you and realize that, that we've still got a ways to go before we're going to be through whatever this disruptive energy is. I do think there will be some stabilization, but like I said, I don't think the stabilization is necessarily going to be um, some sort of uh, unified chorus of people coming together and holding hands. It could go that way. Um, it could just as easily go the way of, of fascism. This is the time in which these components are being tested and put out there and, and, and having some traction. So um, I hope that's answered the question. Uh, Jane Robinson has a, a question. Uh, can you speak more about the December Jupiter-Saturn conjunction uh, to the US moon in Aquarius? Uh, curious to hear more. Of course, Jupiter will get right on that moon uh, a lot faster than Saturn uh, will, um, but uh, could you speak more to, uh, to those uh, transits on, over the moon? Sure, absolutely. Let me get back to where those, uh, where that happens to be. So here's the chart, um, and I'm um, I'm going to pull up the drawing tool so that I can address it um, with the points here. So the question is about the moon's placement is at 27 degrees of Aquarius right here in the U.S. chart, and here is the conjunction that's occurring um, at this time. Interestingly enough, there will also be what would be uh, called a return for Pallas Athena at the same time. Now, what I would say that this is going to represent for the moon is an increase in idealism. And, and keeping in mind that idealistic thinking is in, in essence, there is a neutrality to that word. Uh, people who are fascists or totalitarians are idealistic. People who are communist are communist based or socialistic or even capitalists, they're all idealistic. And so what I think the question is going to be is what idealism is going to set the pace going forward for the United States during this next year? 
and whatever it is is going to begin the building blocks of however we're going to shape that nation and a lot of that's going to be determined by what occurs at the election in November the 3rd. I think what we can all be I, I guess honest with and, and sensitive to is that we know that um, we are reaching a, a point where it is kind of either or and you, you know you're either going to be taking a position in which um, that it's, it, it's tribalism, and we're, we're seeing a tremendous amount of tribalism worldwide, or we're going to step forward into an acknowledgement that the, the globalization needs to be retooled, but ultimately it is still the safest way to move forward with civilization. And I think what's gonna to happen to answer the question is, is that this energy is going to provide a time period in which that answer will be settled or at least be established and things will be built off of that, that issue. And what that will likely look like will be a, a question of what the outcome is from the November 3rd election. Well, could you say, speak more about the, the uh, whether you would consider Pluto ruling the, uh, the corporatocracy or the, these uh, big corporations that are behind the scene kind of pulling the strings, paying for all this? Uh, would you say that's a, a, a element of this Pluto or, or the Saturn? Um, how, how would you speak to that? So keep in mind that, first of all, Capricorn's uh, issue is consequences. And Saturn being in Capricorn is also looking at consequences. And Pluto is an upheaval energy. But it's also power. And so if you look across the breadth of, of what's going on, there's a lot of things that are occurring that are showing, of course, the failure of the system. So, you know, the, the healthcare system is showing its weaknesses. Um, you currently have uh, a number of uh, things that are occurring in, in the business world that are being disrupted, and that's what Pluto is actually here to do. And the idea that, that there's going to be able to control this would be the same thing that if you think about England during the Revolutionary War, in no way thought that they were going to lose control of the American colonies. That was not considered even a possibility. The idea that corporations are gonna be able to hold their power regardless of, of how much information they're collecting through the resources they have or the use of drone technology or whatever it is can also be hubris on their part. It's not to say they're not gonna try. Um, it's not gonna say that there aren't gonna be those possibilities, but the whole point of really this energy is that the disruptive forces are extending beyond because again, you, your idea of trying to have control, that's, that's largely an illusion. Um, it, it's, a, it's a useful illusion. It's an illusion that does a lot of interesting things, but ultimately this whole upheaval process of Pluto coming back around in itself um, has also the flavor of the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, you know, if you think about what the corporatocracy represents, I'm quite confident that if you were to look at the Roman Empire, there was a corporatocracy when it was at the height of its power, that in its own behavior undermined itself. So um, the, the way I sort of use it in a very simplified metaphor would be this, is as soon as you decide to let the foxes run the hen house, they're gonna eat all the hens. Once they've eaten all the hens, the bigger foxes are gonna eat the smaller foxes. And whatever fox is left by itself is gonna starve to death. So the, the idea of the, the plutonic return is a time of revolution. If we're looking at the corporatocracy as the pinnacle of control, and you've got Pluto returning to itself, there is a good chance that its behavior will actually undermine itself. I think that's possible with this particular set of transits. Uh, whether or not it achieves it or not, we'll see what plays out with the choices that are made. But it's kind of like if, if those of you that live in California and remember Enron, um, sort of the joke about Enron was they were stealing successfully but they got too greedy and then they ultimately imploded on them. And I think there was a book that was written uh, called The Smartest People in the Room. So um, the idea that the, the corporatocracy is gonna be able to keep control or uh, have what it thinks it's going to get out of this particular period of transition may not be what they think it is. That does, that gives us hope. Your, does that answer your question, Gail? <laughs> that was a good, good answer. I, it, could, it could give us hope. Um, um, man plans and 
even on a corporate level, but the plans that uh, man ha man is just not a, a, is smart enough to to have have it all under control. No. I mean, think about the um, major companies that have failed in the last say ten years, right? When Sears was at the peak of its power, no one at Sears would have thought that Sears was ever going to go out of business. The, the, the idea here is, is that everything's a construct and Pluto returning on itself is likely to disrupt anything if it is, again, Capricornian and Capricorn's energy is expecting things to be done in the right way. I mean, Capricorn's energy is ultimately responsibility. And if there's irresponsibility, the corporations may end up facing difficulties that have nothing to do with their ability to control people or control data any more than, you know, if, and let's just say, let's just say that you have a corporately engineered virus out there, depending on whatever position you want to take about the virus. Like anything else, it's kind of like Jurassic Park. You think you're controlling it until you're not. And then the thing you thought was going to provide you with control actually ultimately undermines your control. That possibility exists within this particular set of transits. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else's question. So um, the, the, the current Mars um, situation, Mars in, in Aries, um, could you speak anything to the, uh, about the fires in California? There, there's some idea that they're being set, um, that this connection with the Mars in Aries, of course, touching off the, the Pluto return, or, even though it's not Pluto's not exact, it, it's in range, it's very close, um, and Mars totally. triggering it. Uh, do you have anything to say about this Mars and uh, Capricorn well, I mean, preparing? You know, again, Mars and Aries is aggressive, and um, <laughs> the the thing that's that's making it particularly challenging is that it is always an energy that wants to take action. Now it's gone retrograde. And, and it, it wants to do action and there's a frustration around that. And then it's creating an aspect with Pluto, which is, um, and, and when, I, when I wrote about it, I, I tried to give it this kind of framework. You're talking about Mars, which is the Roman name for the God of War and the sign of Aries, which is the Greek name of the God of War in a challenging aspect, a disruptive aspect with Pluto which is the god of death, and it's in the sign of Capricorn, which is ruled by Saturn, which is, um, you know, the one of the one of the Titans, and it's it, it's it's violent. I mean, and whether we're talking about violence in nature or we're talking about violence in human beings, this is a violent period, and it is uh, a period in which uh, that's going to play out until Mars gets into Taurus. Uh, because it is in its, you know, act first, or react later, and then Pluto's in there trying to say, you know, we've got a lot of problems here that we've got to deal with, and and then you add to it in some ways the cultural paradigm of the United States, which means that Mars is actually squaring by sign the sun of the United States at this particular time. So you have, in essence, um, a uh, an energy in which Mars is creating uh, a difficulty with the natal sun and the natal Pluto of the United States. Um, and that's that's going to be, again, a, an increase. And uh, also, of course, problematic about this is that Mars is staying in Aries in a ridiculous long period of time because the retrograde occurred late in Aries, which means it's going to back up but not go back into Pisces. And then it's going to go direct again. So rather than spending the normal two to three months in a sign, it's going to spend six to almost seven months in, in the sign of Aries, which it rules. And, and so this, you know, this is just hard times. Uh, that I, there's no way to sugarcoat the Mars uh, combination. And that's why a lot of what I'm advising any of my clients is, you know, be very, do not be naive about the, the way the world is certainly just being disrupted right now, because it, it is, uh, it's, it's a powder keg, uh, basically. Oh, I have a question here from Elizabeth again. Uh, do you have anything to say about the 2020 election in relation to Tecumseh's revenge? Well, um, I, I guess I would want to know what uh, what is meant by Tecumseh's revenge. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the 
language or the reference of it, but I would need to know what the what Elizabeth is meaning by Tecumseh's revenge. Um, I could answer that. Um, Please do, Tom. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Tecumseh was the uh, brother of, uh, I'm sorry, his brother was a shaman. Uh, Tecumseh was defeated in one of the battles. And his brother, the shaman, put a curse on the U.S. saying every 20 years, one of your chiefs will die. So we've had Garfield uh, assassinated, uh, Harrison assassinated, Kennedy assassinated, Reagan attempted. Lincoln assassinated, uh, all the presidents in the years that are 20 years apart, like 2020, 2000. Now in the 2000s, you could say Gore won the election, but he didn't become president, so he wasn't assassinated or attempted, but he was screwed out of his, you know, his uh, victory. That was actually proven by a bunch of uh, U.S. Uh, academics who spent an entire year uh, recounting all the votes in Florida and coming to the conclusion that he, he won the electoral vote as well as the popular vote. So he should have been president. So um, all these presidents, every 20 years, something happens to disrupt their presidency. Uh, FDR was elected in 1940, but he didn't die in office until the next term. But you could theoretically say that he um, had, uh, you know, died because of that as well. So that's all I have to say about Tecumseh. Seems to follow that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that happens every 20 years. Right. And, and Elizabeth did uh, fill that in uh, about the, uh, and every president inaugurated from a zero, probably degree election, died in office, at all four assassinations, also other deaths, uh, DR stroke one. Uh, but I, as I understood it, that was because uh, that, that conjunction was happening in earth signs. And, and this marks the first time it, it really is uh, full on going to be happening in air signs for, for a long time. Period. What do you say, Philip? Well, I think um, so. So, if we play out multiple al alternate realities, and the idea is, so one reality is, is that um, Trump most likely, if he wins, of course, he'll have to win from electoral vote. It's unlikely that he's going to win by popular votes, considering how badly he lost by the popular vote to begin with. Um, and so, let's say that that's a reality that comes about. Um, is it possible that he doesn't finish out the term either because of age, health issues, uh, any of those things? Quite possibly that would be uh, one, one thing that could occur, especially if uh, the pattern is uh, rock solid. So in, in other words, whoever becomes president, if the pattern is following what has been researched and uh, demonstrated, then it's likely that whoever becomes president in this cycle is probably not going to finish out the term. Um, if Biden becomes president and he also has a health issue or maybe an assassination attempt or anything that ends his presidency. Uh, what's interesting about that reality would be that Camilla Harris would become the first female president in a sort of um, uh, side door type of uh, process. And that would be in its own way, a very interesting way to get a leadership, uh, a female leadership opportunity for the presidency that is not a direct vote. So um, I think that, you know, again, I would certainly uh, defer to the research and to the, the uh, whatever's been proven to be a, a repeatable pattern, because that's really how the patterns work, that it's likely that whoever does end up winning the election most likely will not see out the term uh, for whatever reason that, that might be. Um, to me, more the interesting question is the ideological shift. That, to me, is what I see coming with the, uh, with the combination of Jupiter and Saturn being in Aquarius, is that Ideologically, if Trump is able to win the presidency, then uh, whatever ideology he wants to present, he will be able to uh, assert um, pretty much without any regard going forward uh, for any type of, of limitation whatsoever. Um, if Biden wins the presidency, um, the question will be the progressive element within and also the setting the stage for possibly a new socialism and um, maybe even FDR level types of opportunities to restructure the government's role in the society and 
uh, playing a role. Because again, keep in mind, one of the things that came up recently with this election cycle is the idea of the global basic income and the, the possibility that that may have to become a reality. That would be very much an Aquarian type of solution to a particular problem. But I think to answer her question, um, I would again be happy to agree that if there is a clear um, historical pattern shown from that uh, information, that most likely whoever is elected probably will not play out the term. But my more interesting concern is what's the ideological, what's the weather we're going to be like, or what's the ideological intention going to be with Jupiter and Saturn combined? And I would say that it's going to have to be a wait and see. I know what I would like it to be. I know, you know, which positions I would support um, and would like to see come about, but I would certainly not sit here and say that it's going to be a better world, um, you know, with the election. There's just a lot that's going to be needing to be worked out. I think that there will be a direction very clearly defined by whichever candidate comes into power. Anybody have another question? We're ready for more questions. Um, I'm thinking about that the Neptune influence um, last year in 2019, uh, that with the Jupiter square Neptune. Um, three times last year. I mean, that was the, the predominant influence, I think, last year. In some way, I think that set the stage for, for this year. Um, we had all the, uh, the, with the media, the compute, you know, a lot of um, um, just, what do you call fake news, but a, a lot of, uh, you know, the illusion, illusion and delusion uh, on a big, on a grand scale, um, leading to this year uh, where we can't, hardly know what to trust uh, as far as what you're hearing. Uh, do you want to say anything about that to Philip? I mean, sure. that, that was a precursor to this year. Sure. So I think what's interesting about the, the age that we've entered, and I actually follow um, a gentleman who writes for the music industry. His name is Bob Lefsetz, and he has a blog, and he wades into political discussion. But one of the things that he's particularly insightful about is the transformation of society mainly through his experience with music. And he also talks about the movie industry and, and largely the entertainment industry, which plays into the social media circumstances that I think your question is addressing in this way, is that we no longer have a sort of common understanding of music or movies or anything. If you take, for example, a couple of the movies that were the most successful, whether we're talking about Marvel's Avengers movie, um, or Titanic or any of those things, they can still be something that you can meet someone on the street and they've never seen it. But if you go back to the, say, the late 70s and early 80s and you were to raise the, the comment about Star Wars, the fact is, is that we had three news broadcasts, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and we then had public television. Uh, Fox News was, you know, in its infancy at some point but there was more of a consistency of, of, of information. Now we live in a society that I can have an opinion and all I need to do is go find some source that reinforces what my opinion is. So this would be, to your point, I think that square really broke open the idea of, um, of with Neptune's sort of delusionary energy and Jupiter being in Sagittarius in its own sign and remembering that Sagittarius is about beliefs, that there would be a crisis of belief. And I think that's exactly what we're dealing with. And not only that, but if we, if we consider that this chart is accurate or provides a good frame for Detroit in the United States, Neptune has been moving through the fourth house of the family since 2010, and it's a dissolving energy. And when Jupiter was at the time you're describing uh, moving through the first house, the sort of identity and energy of the United States, what are we really facing in terms of probably the, one of the largest crises with COVID, which is, parents not being able to do their work because they can't take care of their family because they need the school system to provide the, the location for the children to go, for them to go to work, being two parents working. And then if they can't, then suddenly the family's in jeopardy. So this Neptunian transit through the fourth house is fundamentally 
um, bringing up the delusion or the, the dissolving of the American family, which has been going on much longer than just 2010 to now, but it's reaching a crisis point while Neptune's in its position. And in that square with Jupiter, I would say that you're probably right, because here's the other thing that uh, you'll, you'll probably notice as well, Gail, that's coming out of it, and others that, that may realize is you finally do actually have some examples, not consistent, of Twitter now beginning to censor uh, things that would be equivalent to yelling fire in a theater. There comes a point where even Facebook or Twitter has to realize it can't just be an absolute free-for-all and not expect that it's going to probably destroy in some ways our sense of what can be considered viable and, and real in, in our daily lives if we're just allowed to have an opinion and, and then go find a PhD that will support that for whatever reason or why, why they're doing that. So I think it's an excellent question to ask about. And, and, but that, that to me is, is the idea is that these transits and where they're occurring, um, the United States with the plutonic return is basically being upheaved. It, it, and, it, and the upheaval is coming internally. It's, you know, you're not, you're not going to take this, quote, country down externally. Um, it's going to be coming from with the inside. And this dissolving energy of Pluto is occurring, you know, deep in the U.S. chart and advancing on the IC. And Chiron is also um, in Aries. So the wound, if you think about the wound of, of the United States being Aries, it's a wound of individualism and selfishness. And then you've got the movement of Uranus going through the sixth house, which is day-to-day -day work and health, right? Our country is experiencing some of the worst situations with regard to the virus because we are one of the unhealthiest nations um, on the planet with regard to the, the care of our actual bodies, which then takes us back to the second house and, and, and body issues. So you can see how this is all really coming together. Right, good. Uh, yeah, I can see how it really uh, led to a uh, a distrust. Uh, and who, do, who do you trust? That belief and uh, and Neptune, uh, at God or, or spirit or something, you know, being unable to, not knowing what to trust. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one from Debbie. Given that Mercury stations direct on election day, when do you see us knowing who actually won once it clears its shadow? Well, I think it will have to be after the shadow. I think that's an excellent question and a great observation. What we know for sure, based on, I think, the observation of and the rhetoric of the current president is there is no election result in which that individual does not win that will be considered a cheat. The real question will be is if the numbers, both electoral college-wise and um, the, the popular vote, what they, the the difference is will determine the length of time of a potential transition of power. Um, but the, the idea will be that I think that's an excellent point that we will not know on election night. We will not know any time afterwards. And, and for people who do not know what the shadow um, reference is, um, what that means is, is that when Mercury or any other point starts its retrograde phase, whatever degree that is, the point then goes backwards and then goes direct but it isn't considered a complete and fully finished retrograde process until it gets back to that degree it went, went retrograde on. So um, where it goes retrograde, until it gets back to that degree, it's still in effect dealing with the impact of the retrograde phase. So I would say, yes, we're probably not going to have any chance of knowing until Mercury is fully through the entire phase and out of its shadow. Um, okay, we could look and find that date, but um, um, yes, yeah, so uh, we have another question here. Um, wondering uh, from Judy, w when will there be a positive movement out of all this, this disruption? Can you have you looked ahead to the future? Does uh, a years or several years down the road when you think that we might be? Uh, coming out of this phase of extreme disruption. Well, I, I think the 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 thing that I'm I'm I don't like having to say and think about in my own mind is that we don't have to move in a positive direction. the The reality is is that it is a um, it is a wishful it is wishful thinking to think that progress is always positive because we think of progress meaning improvement but progress simply can be 
forward direction. Uh, unfortunately, we have the dark ages as an example of going backwards for a really long period of time. Um, I would not like to see that happen, but I will not suggest that anything in astrology suggests a positive outcome. And um, it's easy to want to wish for that. I would like that to happen. It's certainly possible that we could have amazing advances um, with regard to that Jupiterian energy in Aquarius. It has a benefactor energy, but Saturn is there as well. And if you look at traditional astrology, Saturn is a malefic and Jupiter is a benefactor. So there's sort of a, a those energies merging together is, is a prudent thing going forward. What I would say is, is that if we want to see a positive energy, the way we would think of positive being that we're helping each other out, we're aware that we need to restructure education, that we need to um, think about how money is redistributed across the society because Money is just redistributed no matter what. It's just a question of how we redistribute it. There's never been a scenario in which there isn't a redistribution of money. That occurs. It's just a question of whether we use the tax rates of the 1950s, which for the highest and wealthiest members of the United States happen to be close to 90%, or we use the current rates of 35%. We're going to use rates in some way, shape, or form. So the question is really going to be in mass, where are we? And we're, I think we're going to kind of get a clue of that um, when we see what comes out of this election. But more importantly, what we decide to do when we know that part of our spiritual challenge as a civilization is how are we dealing with these autocratic, totalitarian, strong men type of energies that are in a backlash to the loss of what they consider an ability to have power versus moving into a more egalitarian type of society, which globalism does in a way, if you think about it, that can be very disruptive. If, for example, and this is where some of the anger is probably coming from, is that I was making $32 an hour in the United States doing something that someone in China was doing for 32 cents an hour, and those things were nice and separated because of a lack of globalization. Globalization comes along and it does create a more egalitarian a situation where the person in China starts moving up in their money, but you have a closed system actually. And so in order for that closed system to function, there has to be perhaps a removal of value from another part, part of the system. So that person that was making $32 an hour is now making $12 an hour, whereas the person in China is now making $2.50 an hour instead of $0.32 cents an hour. So the, the idea is that as we try to create a more egalitarian scenario, there are going to be people with privilege that are going to, in their mind, see their privilege removed, and they're not really going to be happy about it. Okay. Um, there's another question um, from Elizabeth. Are there any other countries having this issue with Pluto, for instance, Russia? Well, they certainly are. I mean, if you look at the, um, the, the, one, the, the man that challenged Putin and ended up being poisoned recently, um, that is definitely in play. And so if you think about Pluto's energy and how it's affecting, it's going to be more noticeable among the more powerful countries in the same way that China is experiencing disruption in relation to Hong Kong, where you're not going to see the same perhaps level of disruption is the smaller players on the field. Um, if you take, for example, say New Zealand or Australia, they just don't have, you know, as large a play in the, in the global dynamics. But the reason that it's easy for us to focus on United States and everybody else to sort of deal with the United States is at the moment we are still recognized as the single superpower in the world. Uh, but you can also look at Pluto's disruption and how it's affecting the European Union. Brexit um, is a perfect example of Plutonic energy uh, triggering the European Union and trying to resolve its own issues with regard to Pluto. So Pluto's got its play in everybody's in everybody's pie, without a doubt. Uh, Judy wants to know if um you can see in the chart, will Trump have to be removed from office? Well, that will probably be, again, a sliding scale. Um, if, if he loses the election by a small margin, the necessity of removing him from office will be more violent than if it is a large scale. But I think the reality is, is that he will probably have to be, he will challenge any decision that doesn't have him as the winner. And um, and, the, and the question will then be um, how willing uh, we may have to be if we are having to remove the bully or remove someone from a position that they're not going to give up, even if the, because again, 
all the things are setting the stage for it, there can be no true outcome that doesn't put this person staying in power that isn't achieved. So it'll be fraud by mail, it'll be fraud by this, it'll be fraud by that. That's all being set up. That's all being played out. And it's, it's a test for the larger civilization to decide who do we want to lead us and how and where will we come together if we are in a position where we have to apply that. And a lot of that won't apply for us as the individuals in where we are in the world if we're not part of the larger military construct or we're not playing at the higher levels. We will be in some way probably at the mercy of whatever that turns out to be. But I would say that we're going to face, a again, a crisis of how we resolve this. And um, the astrology is really asking us to look at what that means in a very real sense. Um, and, and so um, I do think that you're, you're going to face, no matter what, um, the belief of the current administration that there's no scenario in which they don't stay in power. There's an interesting eclipse coming up in December. It's on uh, Trump's um, sun moon opposition. And maybe we'll be able to look at that more in a later um, uh, Zoom with some of our other speakers. And we have a speaker in November that's going to talk about the eclipses this year. Um, and that might be an interesting um, thing to look at. I've got a couple other questions. Um, from Frank, uh, could you say something about the Neptune to Neptune opposition in 2021 with the increasing problem, fake news, misinformation on the internet, crazy conspiracy theories, QAnon, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, I would say that the, you know, the opposition is probably going to try to start rebalancing some of that. Um, you know, the, the idea being that the other thing that's going to be a question is what's going to transpire with the younger generation that is coming up that is media savvy, that is aware. I mean, if you look at the conspiracy theories and who's really uh, the bulk of that group, that, that participatory group, um, it is a much older group. Of course, it is probably a much more Caucasian group uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, and in many ways, if you think about it, the mind of the, the boomer generation was really unprepared for what Facebook and social media actually represents. I think the opposition is going to bring about a uh, sort of a, if you will, a potential settling, a rebalancing. I mean, to me, that's what the opposition is really representing as a, a seeking balance of something. And if you note that the Neptune of the US chart was in Virgo, which means that it's about fruit. It's supposed to be about fruit. And the idea of going back to Gail's point about where Jupiter was when it was squaring Neptune by transit, it was also squaring the natal Neptune of the US chart as well. And that, that was, I think, a peak moment in which now we are going to see that those energies um, have, have got a lot of activity. But once again, what will continue to happen, and this is the idea of we're having to redefine through social media a stability around information. And the first phase of it is a tremendous amount of chaos because it's like social media came along and there was no idea of how extreme and powerful it was. In other words, think of the development of the nuclear bomb and when they dropped those bombs and realized we don't ever need to use this ever again, I would say that the opposition of Neptune um, at, a, at almost a spiritual and um, at this level of, of uh, sort of a conspiracy theory or uh, misinformation or disinformation, it will potentially peak at that time. And, um, and the question will be, can that opposition uh, help us actually get back to a new type of balance that will be representative of these systems being in place long enough for them not to be so new and unknown that we realize we have to, um, in some way, monitor them more effectively, or we have to put uh, some sort of uh, control out there that indicates that we need to reach back to that Neptunian energy in Virgo that says, you can't just say what you want to say without backing it up. So let me give you an example, um, perhaps to also answer the question. Um, I had a client recently uh, say that they were concerned that Biden and, and the Democrats were Marxist. And I was like, okay, have you read Marx? Have you, have you read an actual single sentence out of one of Marx's work? Do you know anything about Karl Marx at all? And, um, and the person had to admit, no clue. Haven't read a single word of Karl Marx. And, I, and I'm like, so that to me is the idea of, of Neptune and Virgo is 
you can't just say anything you want to say without going to source material or, or digging into a critical way of thinking. And, and there's been such a long sort of journey right now of uncritical thinking that social media actually promotes that I'm hoping the opposition, I'm hoping the opposition will bring about a rebalancing of that. Well, I'm sorry. I was thinking about uh, the uh, censorship of all, you know, that, that's in play right now that um, so many people who are trying to get out the truth about what's going on are being censored from Facebook and uh, Instagram and everything that's owned by the big corporate, um, the corporate, the biggies, the Googles or whatever, you know, the, uh, that they aren't allowing uh, people to really have free speech. So. But, but again, Gail, you sent me a wonderful set of links. Um, you know, YouTube videos that are being posted. The, the thing about it is, is that they're not getting traction, but the videos that you sent me, the information that was available was tremendous. The, 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 the thinkers were, you know, they're not getting scale, but they're not being suppressed. I mean, someone didn't come to any of, I mean, I was able to look at all the videos you sent me. No, no one was shutting down those videos the, the fact is, is that on some level, they're not, quote, a threat because there isn't enough traction. What I would say that's interesting about this opposition is that I think there may be a chance that that has a, an opportunity to perhaps gain some traction. And then it would be a question of what would the censorship actually be? But the truth is, is there are amazing you know, thinkers out there that are not getting as much attention, but I wouldn't say that they're being shut down. Um, otherwise, you would have been able to send me that information. Well, they are being taken off of or censored off of Facebook, the, the certain platforms uh, that uh, are censoring people, uh, you know, with too much violence, say, or, you know, that Facebook uses that excuse, it, it's too violent, or it, they're using bad words, or that's hate speech or anything, and they, they do the platform. Right, uh, but again, that's, like Facebook. Facebook, that's Facebook's platform. They're, 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 they're trying to achieve something completely different. And the, the speakers that are trying to use Facebook's own platform to challenge what is fundamentally philosophical to Facebook, no, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to be allowed to be on Facebook, but they're not, I mean, you obviously know about them and we're able to pass that information along. That's what we're really facing as part of the challenge is, is that the information is not going to flow through a corporate sponsor, but, you know, once it's posted or once someone gets it out, um, there are all alternative ways to get the information. That's what makes it revolutionary or makes it um, a potential. I think we have all those potentials at play. That's why I'm saying that you know, as much as the corporate sponsors want to think they've got control of something, things keep slipping through the cracks and that will continue to be part of it. I mean, we're having this discussion. If, if the NSA were really wanting to be concerned about it, they would shut down our Zoom control right now. They would just turn us off. We wouldn't even be talking about this. That is heartening, isn't it? Okay, so we have another question from Patty. Uh, what do you think the effect of transiting Saturn conjuncting the US Pluto prior to the Pluto return will be? Well, I think again, um, Saturn is restrictive. Um, and, and, and the idea is that what's really um, hammering a lot of the United States psyche is the kind of in the immediate gratification. I mean, Amazon's trying to resolve it by you know making it that when you want something it's delivered um, as quickly as possible. But if you think about um, the restriction that the uh, people are feeling right now that, and, and so to put it in another context, people have asked me about, you know, when are we gonna get past the virus? When are we gonna get back to normal? All of those kinds of things. And the metaphor I've been using is this. Think of a baseball game. We're in the first inning of a nine inning game and there's a good chance that it's gonna go to extra innings. And you know, the, the problem with thinking about, wow, this is tedious and, and, and we've, you know, we've been dealing with this for such a long time. The Great Depression lasted 10 years. And, and then you had World War II following that up. We're in, a, we're in a scenario where it's a long haul and Saturn is the first shot over the bow going over Pluto is in many ways saying that part of the disruptive energy is actually a disruption to limitation which is what you also get with the fiat currency and the concerns about inflation versus deflation, which is if we were really to allow capitalism to run its course, 
the, the reality is, is that we would see deflationary results in our economy, but we are continuing to keep prices inflated through the printing of money. But the reality is, is on some level, at an intuitive level, we know that we're in debt. There's this huge amount of debt around the world. And Saturn, in many ways, is kind of over Pluto, calling that out in, in various ways. So what we're finding is restriction. And I think we're actually seeing that with lockdowns or people's own behavior about their worries about the virus and whether or not they can contract it, difficulties with the school system. All of that, I would say, is, this, is the Saturnian plutonic combination where it's just more limitations and more restrictions. Okay. I don't know what Elizabeth means about Bob Woodward. I think that probably followed up with a previous question, but um, Elizabeth uh, says, Bob Wood Woodward, question mark. Um, it'd be interesting to see his chart in relationship to Trump's, probably. <laughs> well, absolutely. And again, I would say one of the, and this might be a good uh, topic for um, a future speaker, if someone has an interest in it, is looking at, and, and for example, the reason I use the whole science system is my interest in Hellenistic astrology. And specifically, when I read Dimitri George's book, Astrology and the Authentic Self. And from a Hellenistic viewpoint, what you would look at is the leaders of any nation are a reflection energetically of some aspect of that nation that comes into power. So I would think looking at Trump's chart and looking at Biden's chart from a more very traditional astrological viewpoint, which is how is Trump a representative of the nation of the United States? Because in a lot of ways, he is an effective representative, just like Barack Obama was an effective representative, as was George Bush Jr. and each president before them. But that hasn't been as much a part of astrologies. At least I don't come across very many articles about the idea that we would look at a, a, a leader as uh, a chart that would be determinant of a direction with regard to the country. But, you know, anybody that is in the public discussion at the level of someone like Trump or Biden or Woodward or any of those people, it would be interesting to look at those charts and think about what they represent. Now, when the election was going on between Trump and Clinton, what was interesting about that for me as an astrologer, because I, I did write an article about it, was my observation is that Trump and Clinton would have been an excellent combination. Clinton's a Scorpio. She has, her design is, as I interpret it was never to be out in the forefront um, leading the sort of presentation, but Trump is all show. Now, if you had a healthy version, keep in mind, there's nothing in Trump's chart that indicates that he's going to be a narcissist and that's how it's going to turn out for him. Uh, the way that this is always demonstrated is, is you give uh, someone a chart um, that is learning astrology and you give them Adolf Hitler's chart and you don't tell them it's Adolf Hitler, they will, as positive people say, all sorts of positive things about that chart and they won't be wrong. That there's nothing in the chart that's going to suggest that the shadow side or the positive side is going to emerge. That's going to be the experiences that happen to play out. So Trump with a certain type of experiences has got a phenomenal design a charisma. What I would say that I observed in Trump's chart when I looked at it is this is an incredibly charismatic chart. That is not the case with Clinton's chart. That's just not what the design turned out to be. Now, if you take those two charts and you were to utilize those two people at their strengths, the strength of Trump is to be out there as the showman. And the strength of Clinton is to be able to manage a lot of the power structures behind the scenes. Now, if those people were both operating in some sort of positive framework, there's a chance that those two charts could do some amazing things together. That isn't the reality of those individuals, but that is the astrology extracted from the specifics of those individuals and how they are interpreted by people based on their life experiences. So I, I guess Bob Woodward is, is uh, in combination with Trump, is, is doing um, a certain... Uh, engaging in a certain process. And, and uh, Elizabeth uh, filled out the question about Bob Woodward saying that uh, we were, I was talking about censorship and he just published a book and I'm not quite sure, but it, it's certainly being talked about a lot and it's um, being used. Um, well, so the, the thing that's going on that's frustrating, and this is uh, going back to even the question about the opposition with Neptune and your question about, um, is that the, the fact of the matter is, is that 
nobody's worried about Bob Woodward revealing something about Trump and transforming anyone within the dynamic of being a Trump supporter um, or being against Trump. In other words, in some ways, what a lot of has, Trump has revealed is it doesn't matter. Bob Woodward right. um, might be able to do some amazing things with getting Trump to reveal himself, but the reason that you know, and, and the, the Republicans might scratch their heads as a group, why did he do this interview when Woodward is an excellent scribe, an ability to get a person to reveal themselves, is that on some level, Trump goes back to his original premise, which is, I don't have to worry about saying anything outrageous because I've said everything outrageous and I'm still president of the United States. So it doesn't matter whether Bob Woodward is doing this. It only becomes significant if that information changes and has consequences to it. So the question of consequences is really going to be on some level answered on November the 3rd. And the real question is, if the answer is we want a world that's different than the one that has been developed with the current administration, and we're not just talking about Trump, we're talking about McConnell, and we're talking about Lindsey Graham, um, and we're talking about you know a, a group of people that um, have a particular vision of the world that they are getting to impart and, and in some ways play out. But think of this, this was an interesting article that, that came across my screen, that, that now the children of 9-11 are gonna be voting age for this election. So that's an interesting idea is to realize that there's also you know, a surging number of people that will be voting that were part of you know, the, the Parkland shootings and, and the school shootings. Those young people are going to be voting in this election. So the question is, is that if we do have a shift of consciousness, that is that shift gonna be so strong that it will reveal itself without a doubt against the other position and require a shift in consequences that finally comes home, or is it still too early for that shift to occur? That to me is gonna be the interesting question that will have to be answered because on some level, the, the actions that are being presented with regard to attacking the post office and fake news and all that, is a realization that the world of Barack Obama is more the reality in, in daily life than the world that's being presented by this loud information that's, that's being hammered at us. Um, but that's how, you, that's how you create the perception that someone who's being really loud is larger than they actually are. It's like a lot of bark in a small dog. Um, Debbie, um, ask, uh, do you consider the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in December as the start of the age of Aquarius? Uh, well, again, I, I think that's a perfect, uh, a perfect place to say that it starts, but my question would, you know, in kind of return is, does your presumption that the age of Aquarius means a better life for everybody? The age of Aquarius just means that Aquarian energy is going to be the dominant form of energy, which is communal and, 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 and driven around idealism, but once again, I come back to the idea that the age of Aquarius could be an age of totalitarianism as much as it could be an age of um, socialism or, or social communalism. Uh, the, the Aquarian energy is just an energy form. It is not necessarily positive, nor is the age of Aquarius necessarily going to be positive. Would I like the age of Aquarius to embrace the Aquarian concepts of social interaction for the betterment of society? Absolutely. I would love to see that possible. Is it a great marker for the start of the age of Aquarius? Absolutely, because it's gonna occur at the zero degree. What better way to mark the start of the age of Aquarius than a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction at zero degrees of Aquarius? That would be a, a great point to identify that starting point. But do I think that that means that the world's gonna get better just because it's the start of the age of Aquarius? I would have to say, unfortunately, no, I don't. I think it's interesting that, that Jupiter and Saturn in Aquarius will then square the Uranus, the you know, say the ruler of Aquarius, square that Uranus in Taurus, which is in the United States uh, sixth house from the third to the sixth. I mean, and there's going to be, I mean, this whole idea of vaccinating everybody, and um, we already know that vaccines are having a big uh, destructive effect on, on the health of many of the children in the US uh, and a lot of people are upset about that and a lot of information coming out about vaccines, but we have that Jupiter Saturn square, the Uranus in the sixth house. Right, so think about, uh, just think of, first of all, of Jupiter being in Taurus 
and it's disruptive energy with regard to foundations. And not just vaccines, but think about the electric car movement that is being really uh, spearheaded by uh, Tesla. And I don't know how many people may have seen this, but it's definitely a documentary worth tra tracking down if you ever wanted to. It's called Who Killed the Electric Car? The first fully electric cars were actually developed back in, I think it was 1986, 1987. And the documentary follows GM developing a fully electric car. There's a moment in the documentary that I think succinctly explains how disruptive that technology was once GM figured out they were about to shoot themselves in the foot. In the documentary, there's a scene where a mechanic rolls out a cart and on the cart are all the pieces of a gas powered engine that represent the use of rubber and oil and a variety of other things. And he said, if you develop an electric engine, all of this stuff that's on this cart goes away. All of these jobs, all of this industry. Imagine now, and it can be done because I have a friend who has a Tesla. He could drive to my house, which he did, and he can plug his car into my outlet and he can get his car charged. He doesn't have to go to a gas station. He doesn't have to go to a convenience station. He, he can actually pull up to anybody's house and go, hey, if I give you 20 bucks, can I charge my car here? You're talking about a fundamental disruption of, uh, of something that's going to have repercussions, not only in terms of the types of jobs that would be available based on making a gasket for an engine, but also the idea of what happens with the insurance industry when you actually create possibly uh, cars that are being uh, driven without individuals in control, the likelihood of reducing accidents becomes exponential. So the disruptive nature of Uranus and then connecting back to your point, uh, Gail, which is going over and squaring with um, Saturn and uh, Jupiter is you're also going to get some advances that are going to be disruptive in positive ways. It isn't just the vaccine. It's also things becoming safer, uh, more reliable. Um, there are ways in which information may be transmitted that can be more efficient, that can actually help people. So there will be a push pull between control, but also new freedoms that people don't expect or, or understand. Imagine being able to know that you're not going to be late for a meeting because you're on a grid system um, with the cars being controlled. And we may not like the idea of control, but the possibility that it could make life safer is also within that Uranian transit through Taurus. Um, it's not only medical advances, but also technological advances in other areas that could be quite disruptive. And we're seeing that also in questions of what's going on with the schooling being done and the way that we're doing this meeting right now. What we're doing right now would be an excellent example of Uranus and Taurus. And how we utilize it would be the question of the strain that, that could come forward with uh, the energy of, of Saturn and Jupiter being in Aquarius and becoming more crystallized. Now, is it crystallized good or is it crystallized destructive or harmful? It will be a matter of seeing how it plays out. But I think the crystallization is the point of Saturn and Jupiter being in Uranus. And then how is it in tension with Uranus in uh, Taurus? Okay. Another question. How is the rule of law, which is being hammered, destroyed by the corruption of this administration, going to fare? Saturn? Well, I would say that that's the whole point of the truly disruptive piece of it is, is that you almost have to realize that to get back to a rule of law, there sometimes has to be a higher level of chaos. There has to be more chaos than, than people are comfortable with. And that's how totalitarian and, and fascist regimes actually come into power is that they use the chaos as a basis for exerting uh, types of rules that will be new rules and, and established rules. But part of it is, is undermining the rule of law to also change what potential laws will look like. But, but the laws are also at the mercy of changes in technology as well. And so I think what we're, we're going to see is that we're going to be thinking about the law and addressing questions around the law at a deeper, more philosophical level than we ever have because the rule of law is being disrupted. And ultimately, at some level of daily life, people are going to go, wait a second, this is too much disruption. What, what are we actually doing with regard to why we even have the rule of law? What, what do we need it for to keep civilization stable? And what would that look like? So I think these questions are going to be fundamentally addressed and, and disrupted in order to be addressed. Um, so I think in order for us to get to a place of potentially changing laws for the worse or for the better, 
means undermining the existing laws as they currently exist. You mentioned something earlier in your presentation about uh, the Roman times, uh, Nero or whatnot. I can't remember exactly how you said it, but um, the comparison that, and, and there's been the illusion that uh, a civilization in decline uh, or a country in decline uh, uh, um, tries to impose more and more laws as as they decline it's a it's a symptom of the decline of that um, that country or something right so you know one of the things about it is is is, is certainly the idea of um, over regulation under regulation uh, questions around where do we assert our, our engagement in people's private lives with regard to public concern and one of the examples I've shared with people uh, a number of times in talking about, let's say, the virus versus other belief systems. Um, if, if, for example, and again, the virus has, a, has an infection rate that is certainly impressive. Its ability to infect people is quite successful. And, um, but, but someone's belief in flat earth theory isn't effective or infectious in the same way. And so the example I would use is this anecdote. If I get on a plane with you and you're a flat earther and you're sitting next to me, your flat earth theory is really not a threat to me. I might be concerned if you're the pilot, but I can feel pretty confident that no one's gonna let someone attain the level of being a pilot for an airline industry if they actually think the earth is flat. So your belief in flat earth thing is not relevant to me. But if you don't believe that the virus functions as a virus, as a contagion that can be spread around, and there is clearly a, a concern for that, and you get onto a plane and you're not wearing a mask, then you potentially become a threat to me. And that has to be thought about and addressed with regard to the larger societal matrix. So all beliefs are not equal. And beliefs that involve questions around the physical nature of something means that we have to decide how are we gonna set up laws and where are we gonna regulate something. In other words, it doesn't really make any sense for me to not allow a flat earth thinker onto an airplane because that's fine, difference of opinion um, or difference of belief, but they're not in a position or doing something that is actually a threat. But someone that thinks a virus is a hoax could actually be a carrier of the virus because they actually think it's a hoax and I don't want them near me and I am going to be doing something in a public sphere. I need the public sphere to address that. So a lot of the question that we're gonna be teasing out with regard to the rule of law or with regard to regulation and, and regulatory issues is going to be a question of, you know, what do we see as our civilization? And one of the things that's certainly key to, and this goes back to the Chiron positioning in the U.S. chart, is this individualism. And not only that, but the U.S. chart is strongly cardinal. The sun is in a cardinal sign. Mercury is in a cardinal sign. Jupiter is in a cardinal sign. Venus is in a cardinal sign. Um, Pluto is in a cardinal sign. So, you know, there's a sort of um, individualism that's also been part of the history here that if I were a virus and I wanted to spread, this is the country I would want to come to first and foremost. Okay. So, okay, from Tracy, uh, she says, say more about an Obama world. What do you mean by an Obama world versus Trump world? So, one of the things that occurred that was interesting is that Prior to Obama's election, and right around the time of Obama's election, the white majority was not only the white majority among the groups, it was the majority of the overall complete collective. During the time that Obama was elected, the white majority is still the largest minority, but it is no longer the overall majority. And so what happened was that was a loss of privilege. And if you look at sort of Trump's vision of the world and the, the other people, again, going back to McConnell and Lindsey Graham, this is a 1950s vision of white male supremacy that was a period of time in the United States that Obama's election in many ways represented the end of that era. And what I would say or argue is that this is a backlash. This is a backlash to the Obama world that is letting us know that we have a greater amount of diversity. And one of the things I, I've been observing, I, I've been watching um, the show Elementary on Hulu and they run commercials as part of the Hulu package. So you, you see commercials. When I watch the commercials, they are ridiculously diverse, especially 
for car commercials or for insurance commercials. And what I mean by that is there are gay men couples showing up in them. There are gay men couples that are you know, different ethnicities. There are interracial couples that are showing up. There are lesbian couples that are showing up. So the Obama world, I mean, when I say Obama world, I'm talking about the um, actual diversity that is, has occurred because of actually not only immigration, but the allowing of um, interracial and an opening up of, uh, of different forms of marriage and, and society. And if you look at the, the world that's being presented, and I think one of the best examples, if you looked at, um, and I don't know if you may have come across this, when they were doing the, um, the roll call for the delegates once the, uh, each of the uh, uh, presidential candidates had been uh, settled, that when they did Biden's roll call, they, they went to the, the, the different states and they had people in their um, dominant sort of cultural paradigm. So in, in some of the areas of the, the Southwest, there were Native Americans in their guards and they were showing their, their, uh, their delegates through that representation. There was this incredible range of diversity that was occurring. But when you went to the Republican side, it was just a bunch of white guys right down the list. Those were, and they were standing in front of the American flag. So on one side, you've got this incredibly rich diversity. And then on the other side, you've got this singularity. And it could not be more stark than what we're, we're facing right now. And, and again, it's, it's um, what I would say is that, that the Obama world is the world that we're actually living in. But the, the idea of having a particular again, idealistic view and, and asserting something that's being done by one particular group in power is hearkening back to something that is, you know, it's only going to come back through violence. It's not going to come back through a natural process. The natural process is diversity. That's really where the strength of things happens to be. But in diversity, a group that's had power and loses that power isn't going to let go of it just because they think diversity is a good idea. Um, of course, uh, that uh, Pluto went into Capricorn uh, when Obama uh, took right. office. Exactly. Um, but also, the underneath it all, uh, the the well, quote deep state or you know the the military industrial or or however you want to continued it, whether it was Obama or Trump. There's a lot of things that have continued, even though there's this. Uh, more um, there, there's this amount of change or, or disruption or dis destruction of the Pluto uh, by Pluto. Um, that's well, just a thought. Way, let, let me give you a, a not example, Gail, is that you're never going to have power just give up power. But what right. can happen sometimes is that a circumstance can start out innocuous to the presumptive power and not realize the transformative effect until after the transformative effect starts to take place. So let me use an example with regard to football and concussion. One of the things that is slowly happening to the field of football in the United States is fewer and fewer parents are letting their children participate in the sport because the concussion information has made it out into the general conversation. So the, the future of a sport like football is in jeopardy because the generation that's coming up is actually informed about the impact of concussions, but we won't see that effect. It's not like we're going to suddenly go in and dismantle football from concussions, but it could be that football does eventually go away or get transformed in some significant way after many generations because of information that has successfully embedded itself into the story. Just like the military industrial complex may end up ultimately having a problem with globalization, because what globalization means is that people are talking to other people all around the world and they're creating a conversation that's like, wait a second, you're not different from me. You, you've got the same worries and concerns that I do. These things can be, be transformed, but, but they're going to be you know, probably a slow form of transformation. At least that's what I'm hoping for. Well, underneath the surface, uh, there is change happening. One astrologer I listened to was talking about the, the um, Pluto in the next sign deals with what occurred when it was in the previous sign. And so we might not know all the ways that Pluto has changed things until it gets on into Aquarius. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, the, the question will be, and this is, this is to me a reminder, astrology is amazing, but it isn't everything. And when I describe astrology to my clients, I talk about five keys. 
And four of those keys are data points. There is the point, there is the sign, there is the house, there is the aspect, pure data. The sun is in Cancer in the eighth house, in the United States chart, and it has a square relationship with Chiron, fact. The fifth key is free will, the choices we decide to make. We embrace, we resist, whatever it happens to be. And I also happen to be an astrologer that's comfortable with reincarnation. So to me, the idea is that we're gonna get a lot of different experiences. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that we're gonna keep coming back until we learn new things and, and gather information. That's the South Node, North Node um, experience in, in a chart for me is talking about past lives and, and how that's playing out in the present moment. So this is just a moment in time. It, it's just another moment in time. And, um, and it's interesting to be here and to think about how it could play out. Will it repeat a previous moment in time because the elements are there or will we make a change? Will we shift something? Because again, at the time, um, and, and you know, Lyndon B. Johnson is, an, I think, an interesting figure to consider is that he committed cultural male, white male Caucasian suicide, if you will, by really pushing through and helping the Civil Rights Act because the only way you were gonna get civil rights was through the use of the military, right? That wasn't the majority position. And when it was actually put into effect, it was the guns that, that brought about on some level, the transformation to a more egalitarian society with regard to civil rights. That wasn't because we all woke up and went, yeah, people should be equal, let's do that. No, you had to have you know, armed forces going to schools and making sure that those um, African-American children that were going in those schools were protected and they weren't always protected. But the, the changes that come about, that's just the natural flow of things. No, no position of power is ultimately gonna to get to hold on to its power forever. That's what Pluto's return is going to be a, a teacher about. Well, that's, uh, that, that's really salt. I, I'm like, uh, I don't know, does anybody else have uh, questions uh, for Philip? I, I think that that, that really uh, sums up what's happening with this Pluto return, uh, that um, ultimately those in power can hang on to it. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing about it is, no one in power is smarter than the universe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, I mean, I, you know, I don't care how, I mean, because again, if you think about it at the time that was the peak of the Nazi regime, they didn't think they were gonna end. They, they, were, they were gonna see the, the right continue forever. That was their experience, that was their understanding, and oops, they got it wrong, right? But it also goes the other way. It's like we, you know, we thought we were sort of a more egalitarian merit-based society, but what COVID is revealing to us along with other choices of, of the development of power is, oops, we're not. So this is a moment where we're all on some level also feeling the impact of these transits in our own charts. And for each of us, we're gonna get different experiences. I mean, I'm getting tuned up because Pluto is currently squaring my sun. Um, and it's going to be doing that this upcoming year. I'm, I've already got the first pass. It's getting ready to have the retrograde pass. So I'm getting a particular reaction from Pluto in my own chart um, that is, is quite significant. Other people may be getting huge significant transitions based on what's going on in their individual charts. Um, other people may be actually sliding through this. It may not be really disrupting them very much, um, but it's, it's all just part of the process. Uh, an interesting comment from uh, Lynn uh, to everyone it says, uh, Philip, I teach an original concept course on how the soul chooses the chart for the next incarnation. Outstanding. Um, we, could think, we could even think about the U.S. chart. You, you look at the nodes in the U.S. chart, uh, it'll have another incarnation, <laughs> you could say. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, think again also what would be interesting is to go back. I mean, there's so many things to look at. What about when Pluto was opposing the sun at 13 degrees? You know, what was going on at that particular time? Uh, what happened when Saturn was opposing the, the U.S. sun? You know, I suspect there was a, a lot that can be explored and, and written about. I mean, it's just such a rich um, energy. And of course, it's easy to see when we go back and look and identify what that energy was that it ultimately represents after the fact. When we're trying to look forward, I always want to caution anyone that's doing anything not to let a bias of what you would like it to be actually influence the outcome, which is why 
when the group of astrologers predicted Hillary Clinton was going to win the election, and you can do whatever dance you want on top of a pinhead about electoral college, she didn't end up present. They should have never said a thing. That you don't just don't do that. The the thing to do is to realize that we don't know. That's the free will part of it. We do not know. And any astrologer that claims that they they've got that that heads up ahead of time. And you know, there's a guy out there. I think his name is um, Lichtenberg or Lichtenstein, who's successfully predicted the presidential through a, a series of, of things. Um, you know, if we want to believe him, Trump's going to lose. Um, but whether or not that's going to play out in the long run, we won't know until we find out um, after November. And really, I agree with the person that asked about the shadow um, with regard to the shadow energy of the retrograde for Mercury. I think that's going to be significant in, 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 in the amount of time it takes us to get an answer. And that's November 20 when it uh, leaves its shadow. Right. Thanks for doing that um, calculation, Gail. Didn't someone... Uh, let me see. Oh, here's a uh, Lynn. Lynn puts her website in there uh, for people who are interested and in, read it. Read it in the chat. And, um, and then Elizabeth said, "Didn't say, someone say she would win, but wouldn't be inaugurated?" I don't know. Yeah. They, when, anytime you you walk out on the limb of uh, prediction as an astrologer, you're you're really you're really walking out out on a limb. <laughs> Well, and here's the thing. I, I have clients that come to me and, and I have a number of clients that are, are Hindu and they'll come to me and said, my astrologer, my Hindu astrologer said I was going to get married at 27 and I'm 29 and I'm not married. And my offhand comment to that is, did you go back and get a refund? Because what would, if, at the very least, I would say go back and also tell them that you're not married and watch them blame you for something you didn't do correctly because they didn't get their prediction right. The thing I, I don't have a problem predicting, I don't have a problem predicting that when Jupiter and Saturn come together in Aquarius, that there is going to be a coalescing of energy that is going to try to come to some sort of stability. That's what fixed signs do. But I'm not going to say it's going to be kumbaya. And I'm also not going to say that it's going to be fascism. I'm just going to say that predictably, when those energy points come together at the beginning of Aquarius, there is going to be an energetic support for some form of stabilization. I don't have a problem predicting that at all. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? Or um, thank you, Lynn, for <laughs> comment about predictions. Other other thoughts? I, I get a lot of thoughts through my head, but I don't want to be the only one expressing them. And, and perhaps you know we might be at the end. Uh, it's uh, sure. it's almost three. Uh, Perhaps uh, get your questions in, um, and we might let uh, Philip go if uh, nobody else has another question. Well, I, I appreciate Think the quickly. opportunity. I, I hope this has been helpful. I, I wish I could, uh, you know, in some ways put a little more positivity spin on it, but these are tough transits. Um, Pluto return is huge. Um, and then the other transits that are in play, especially the Mars energy um, in Aries, um, and it's squaring the Plutonic energy that's in, in Capricorn. Um, but I want people to be informed. I really, I really am appreciative of the opportunity to share my thoughts about, uh, about this information. Well, we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with all these transits with us, Philip. It's been, a, you know, it gives us a lot to think about. And, and I like you, the way you express uh, the energy around the aspects without going into, oh, it's going to do this or that. I mean, Aquarius is going to be a lot about, of course, AI, and there's a lot of uh, Absolutely. Um, thinking about how that will, you know, in some ways uh, make it make things more stable. But also, people are resisting that, and that's that's square to Uranus, and there's going to be a lot of um, um, going on around AI and and fighting against uh, the way it, people are going to use that to control others or keep keep it surveil others you know that's going to be really interesting with that uranus uh, square um i went i don't know if you've ever looked at progressions but i progressed the united states chart um to 2032 and uh, and and somehow that felt like you know, maybe that by then uh we'd we'd be uh settling into a, a smoother place but um 
uh, yeah, like you have said, I think it's going to take us a while. It's nothing happens overnight. Uh, these disruptions, uh, this these times of crisis. Look at the fourth turning. They talk about every twenty years, uh, one, two, three, four, twenty years uh, segments uh, when uh, things just go into a, a crisis and and disruption and everything. And the last twenty year period was around the uh, time of the uh, the the end of the. 20s going into the mid 40s. I mean, you think about that 20 year period, how much uh, this world went through. So right. um, anyway, there's all, there's so much uh, room for thought. Uh, uh, Judy, you know, everybody saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Excellent, excellent talk. Thank you, Philip. Very fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm going to add my thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Yay. My pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign off then. Uh, thank you, everybody. And, and uh, it's been wonderful having this opportunity. Thank you, Gail. And Tom, uh, thanks for all your help in getting thank the so technology up and running.